Bouncy, 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 bouncy. Okay, I'm done. Well, hello there. You may have noticed recently that I finished this. Took me eight months. There's a video about it. There's two videos about it. You can go watch those if you are interested. I'm sure I'll link them in the description. But you may recall if you watch those videos or if you follow me on Instagram where I pine about it frequently, that this is only chapter one in what could turn out to be a very long book. Chapter two, I am so freaking excited about. I am going to be doing another Mac George Beauty and the Beast stained glass window. The big one. Yes, yes, it's the castle one. I have wanted to do this piece for years, but found it way too daunting because I knew the only way to do it well and to really make it possible to get all that fine detail on there is to do it pretty darn big. So. When I started this piece and saw how big I was making this one, I was like, oh yeah, I could do this other one. So now I'm gonna. My concept is to eventually stitch every single stained glass window from the animated Disney Beauty and the Beast done by the incredible Mac George, who you should look up because his art is gorgeous. I guess I'll have a really cool gallery wall eventually. But because they're all a series, I wanna make sure that not only like all of the color schemes are basically the same, but also that all the sizes are right in relation to each other. I don't want them to all be the same size, but I want them to all kind of fit in the right size realm for the story that they're telling, if that makes sense. So this castle one is going to be the biggest. I don't think I would do another one any bigger than this. And of course it's like, landscape mode instead of portrait mode. So it's gonna be longer than this one, but I want it to be about the same height, which in my mind, I'm estimating that that'll make it at least three times the size of this. Yeah, that seems about right. Probably about three times the size. So if you know much about embroidery or you looked at the title of this video, then you may have already guessed what my first obstacle is going to be, the frame. There's basically two options when you're embroidering anything. You can either have a frame that is big enough to fit your entire design inside, or you can move a frame around your embroidery piece as you go. I don't love the second option. I did it on my very first embroidery piece that I ever did, just a random kit. I only had a very small hoop and I moved it around everywhere as I stitched and it just leaves so many creases. It very easily can snag your thread. It can shift your design around. In general, I don't like doing it and I'm not gonna do it on a piece that means this much to me. So that leaves me with the other option of finding a frame big enough to hold what is probably gonna end up being like two feet long, two and a half feet long, three feet long. Hard to say, I need to figure that out first. And there's some legit embroidery frames. Um, you may have seen the ones, especially for like beading, for like timbre embroidery, for tapestry embroidery, stuff like that. People use these big square frames that you can stretch the fabric across. It's the old school way. As is often the case with me, I decided I didn't want to buy one, I'm gonna make one. This may not end well, but why not? I've gathered up some woodworking materials recently because of all of my, you know, gardening projects on the balcony. So I figured I'll get myself some wood, I'll saw it up, screw it together, and see if I can create my own embroidery frame that is just the right size for this piece that I'm going to do. My initial plans for this were quite lofty. I wanted the stand to be able to fold up flat so that it would be easy to store because we don't have a lot of space right now and having a, a rather chunky embroidery stand that I can't fold and put away could be problematic. I wanted the frame to disconnect from the stand both for easy storage and because I wanted to make a second frame even bigger so I could have two different projects going at once because yes, I also have a project idea that's even bigger than this thing I'm gonna be doing, cause I'm crazy. I wanted the frame itself to be able to tilt up towards me so I could sew on it flat or tilted at any angle. I wanted it to expand both vertically and horizontally. It was a lot to ask of myself considering I have 
no experience in this. So in the end, I tried to explain everything that I wanted to Matt and he kind of narrowed it down to what was more logical for our skill set. So the stand is not going to fold up anymore. It's just going to be four legs all connected. The frame will still disconnect from the stand, which means I could still in the future build that second frame and have another piece going. It is still going to expand vertically so that it will stretch the fabric if all goes to plan. And then we are going to try to do the tilting thing because that's really important to me. I don't want to constantly be sitting like bent over this frame to see downward at it. I need it to be able to come up and meet me halfway. So that's basically the goal and I really want to get started on this thing because I already am so like lonely for an embroidery piece. I mean, there's other things I'm sewing. I have like a commission I'm working on right now. I have some patterns I'm working on right now, but I am so used to having a big embroidery piece sitting around that I can work on whenever I want to, because it's been like, I think like two years since I started the very first one of these. For the last two years, basically, I've almost always had some big embroidery piece that I just kind of work on whenever I want and takes me months to finish. It's been like a week and I really miss it. So I want to get started on this project because I cannot start the actual embroidery until I finish the frame. So let's get going. I got what seemed like way too many boards for this project. They're mostly square dowel rods and like hobby boards. So they're already like sanded for you and everything makes it easier to use them. And then I just tried to visualize the plan because even if I can see it in my head and I can kind of sketch it out, it is very difficult for me to actually visualize where things need to connect and how they're going to connect and all that good stuff. Once I had pretty much figured that out, I started measuring and marking things that needed to be cut shorter, things that needed holes drilled in it. Basically, Matt wasn't home yet and this was my best attempt to prep things before he came in with, you know, the drill. In order to make the frame adjustable, my plan was to drill holes all the way down the side of the two side pieces. That way we could insert a dowel rod through those holes and into the top piece, like the top side of the frame, and we could adjust that top piece up and down in order to stretch fabric out to different sizes. However, we had had trouble finding the one inch square dowel rods that we wanted to use, so we got three fourths inch instead, and they just didn't seem strong enough or wide enough to have all of these holes in them and still maintain the integrity of the wood. Turned out I was right. They did not work very well, but you know, we drilled holes all the way down them first before realizing that it wouldn't work. So that was loads of fun. We were also dog sitting today. So here's a few nuggets. They did not appreciate being separated from each other or from us. I also got some long dowel rods, which I then cut into pieces. Two short ones would be the pegs that would hold the top piece of the frame in place. And then I cut the remainder into two sets of poles that I would be using to create the tilt in the frame. Then it was time to start constructing the stand that the frame is going to sit on. And this needs to be exactly the right height to fit over my comfy green chair where I typically sew, which I think was like, I don't know, 23 inches, something like that. In one of our first trial attempts, we had quickly realized that screwing these pieces of wood together was not a great idea. They're far too thin and small and the wood was just cracking instantly. So we decided that instead we should nail them together and it's a lot easier to nail something together if it's already glued together. So wood glue it is. Hence creating these fun little sculptures that had to stay clamped in order to dry overnight. The next morning I came back to saw some more pieces of wood, sand some more pieces pieces of wood and glue some more pieces of wood. Yay. The puppy is especially needy in the morning though, so first I had to pay him a bunch of attention. After literally like two or three days of trial and error, I finally had the entire stand glued together. And then we came back with nails and just secured some of the cross beams so that it would be sure to not fall apart. And then yes, I did stain this piece in the dark and in a dress because it, sometimes that's just how things go. I 
I revisited Home Depot for what seems like the 25th time and finally found some more of the one inch dowel rods that are just the right size for this frame. Nice and light, but nice and sturdy at the same time. And because it was dark and late and we really wanted to get this done, or rather I really wanted to get this done, we proceeded to finish up the rest of the drilling holes and sanding things inside. Don't yell at me, I know it's not a great idea. If you find yourself taking on a project involving wood and sawdust and drills and such things, please be safer than I am. And of course, while the puppy is very needy in the morning, he is also very needy at night. He just really wants to be involved in anything we're doing. We did come up with this very handy method for sanding the inside of the holes that we drilled, where we basically wrapped sandpaper around a drill bit and then ran it through the holes a few times. Worked like a dream. After that, there was just a tad more sawing left and then like a slightly safer person, I waited until the next morning so that I could go stain the frame out on the balcony where the fumes wouldn't kill us. And with everything glued and nailed and stapled together, there was one last finishing touch that would complete the frame, adding a strip of, I think it's called like fabric tape. It's basically that really strong cording that you would use for like the straps on a book bag or a backpack, or I don't know, maybe a belt. I don't really know. I've actually never really used this for anything before. This stuff just gets stapled to the top and bottom of the frame so that the fabric can be basted onto it and therefore can stretch out nice and tight. And I basically, just filmed the top of my head for about 20 minutes while doing this. You may notice that there are a couple sections of wood that I forgot to stain. I did not notice until about five days later. She's done and uh, she's quite a chunk. I'm reminded of why I originally wanted something that could fold up and be put away because this takes up a lot of space. Luckily, it's also very light. So like, yeah, it's huge and a little cumbersome to move around, but at least it's like super light and easy to carry. So it's gonna be interesting having this in the living room for potentially the next 18 months. It's very wonky as are all of my woodworking projects of late. We don't have super good tools, nor do we have any uh, experience in this craft? What is in my eye? My standards for, you know, wood built projects are pretty low in comparison to, I don't know, my standards for embroidery, but that's all good because as long as it functions, that is all I need from it. So it's a little hard to film because it is so big, but let me try to kind of walk you through because I feel like prior to actually making it, it was really hard to explain. So it should be a lot easier to explain now that, you know, it exists. So first up, there's the stand, which is, you know, a very light piece in itself. It's literally just some pieces of wood stuck together. Is it super secure? That's hard to say. It wiggles quite easily. Hopefully it'll stay together. Then there is the frame itself, which is four pieces of wood that we stuck together. The bottom is secure, so it's like screwed together. It's not gonna move whatsoever. And then this top piece is adjustable. So you can pull out the little spikes here on the ends. And there's several holes down the side, as you can see there, so that you can adjust it to different heights. So, you know, now you have a shorter frame. So for this piece, it's gonna be staying at this upper limit because the piece is pretty big and I need a giant piece of fabric. So I do like the possibility that I could spin this and tighten the fabric even more. I'm just not sure yet if the tension of the fabric will just cause it to spin back in the other direction. So I may have to come up with something to like hold this spun as it is, if that makes sense. So it's basically the same size as the stand. So it fits comfortably on there because you know, again, we don't know what we're doing. It's not exactly level. And then we put these little ledges right here, little bits sticking out on the edge of the frame so that it has something to hit up against 
and therefore it won't like slide off forward. We'll see if sliding off backwards becomes an issue, but I don't think it will be. We put little indentions right here and some angled holes in the bottom of this so that you can add some poles like so, and it will tilt upward and you really can't see that. So let me reframe like so. So this is the, the shorter tilt. And then I also have longer ones. So then this is the full tilt where I can clearly see the whole thing, hopefully. And can you see why I said it's going to be hard to film this? So yeah, that's it. It's a beast. Do I anticipate having problems with it? Yes, I do. But we will overcome them. Hi! So the next step is getting some fabric in there and seeing if it actually works. Let's get on it. Lord. I have 36 inches in length and about 22 inches in width or height, I guess you could call it, to frame here. I think this will be pretty much fine for the piece that I'm doing because it really only needs to be about 15 inches tall. I might do it a little taller than that, but with 22 inches, I really do have some wiggle room there, so it should be all good. I used a white cotton gabardine for the first piece, so I do want to use that exact same fabric so that all of these pieces kind of create a series that matches each other. I also want to use stabilizer across the entire piece here, but I really wanted to avoid using the sticky backed stabilizer that I used the first time because I found it really annoying to sew through. I could like feel the stickiness on my needle and it was just really an unpleasant feeling. So instead I got this iron on stabilizer that comes in a long sheet and it's kind of just tall enough for what I need. So hopefully this will work well. I'm going to also iron over the edges so that there's a nice fold all the way around. Gabardine tends to shed really easily. So same as on the first piece, I just need to make sure that I'm folding over the edges so that they won't shed and fray ridiculously. And this will also be more secure for the way that I'm going to be framing the piece. Once all of the edges were folded over, ironed nice and flat, and then basted down, I could finally attach the fabric to the frame itself, which was quite unwieldy trying to do a very tight running stitch on these long, very square poles. I probably did not need to go nearly as small with my running stitch, but honestly, I just did not want to risk any kind of uneven pulling on the fabric. Then it was time to stretch the fabric in the frame and to get the top rung onto the proper hole, which uh, did not go super well at first. I pulled really hard on it and was just like the slightest amount too short to get it into the very top hole that I had specifically made for this piece of fabric. I felt sure I would not be able to get it up there. So instead I put it on the next rung down and then spun the rod to tighten up the fabric and get that tension there. I threw some clamps on the end to try to keep it in place, but no matter how much I spun that top bar, it was not getting as tight as it should be, and it was just really it was not gonna work. I was getting very nervous about it. And maybe that gave me a boost of adrenaline or something because I came back and tried again and I yanked that fabric so hard and managed to get it into the top hole where it was supposed to be. On the second side, it was so difficult to get it into the right place that Matt had to come and hold down the frame for me so that we could teamwork it. But we got there and oh my God, it is stretched so perfectly. At that point, I ironed the stabilizer onto the back. I had not done it earlier because I did not want to hold the fabric into a relaxed position. I wanted to stretch it out first and then use the stabilizer to keep it in that stretched out position. And last but not least, I had to secure the two sides in a stretched manner, which is typically done by weaving a ribbon around the side bars and pinning it to the fabric, stretching it as you go. I had more of this fabric tape left over because I accidentally bought six yards of it instead of six feet. Happy accident because it was quite useful for this. And it's done. This is slightly terrifying. <laughs> It's so big. It pretty much all worked out as planned, which I am just over the moon about. <laughs> That's a good sound. In basic form, it worked. I have a frame. I can pull this frame over my chair like so. I can reach all the way across it. I can reach all the way across underneath it. Once you start tilting it, it runs into a few more problems. I'm just gonna disappear behind here now. If I tilt it up to the good height, 
then my arm can now only come up this far. <laughs> yeah, I can't really have it tilted and so anything that's at the very top of it, such as life. But you know what? Nothing is perfect and I'm pretty darn pleased. So yeah, if you've ever wondered what, you know, good old fashioned legit embroidery framing looks like, kind of this. I'm not gonna claim this is super accurate. Thank God for embroidery hoops because this is not something I'd wanna do every single time I start a new piece, especially a small one. Like it's a lot of work. Honestly, my biggest concern is just the angle of looking at this and how that'll affect my stitches, which is why I wanted it to tilt up because especially when doing satin stitch in all of these small compartments, looking at my piece from this angle here could really affect how straight my stitches are and how well I get them to the edges. I find it much better to look straight onto a piece as much as possible. So that's why I wanted it to be able to, you know, tilt up like this. And I'm probably gonna try to stitch like that as much as possible. It's just gonna be difficult when I get to the top. I could just, you know, flip the frame over. Like so. I don't know how helpful that will be, we might have to do a little bit of alteration on the frame and the stand in order to be able to do that, but you know, it's there, it's an option. Ah, that's gonna happen a lot. Anyway, thanks for joining me on this exploration. And hey, if you need a frame that's just, just what you need, just the right size for your piece, don't be afraid to just go for it and try making it yourself. A little trial, a little error, eventually you might get something workable. And this is of course, sort of the step one or part one of what will likely be mm, a very long project. So keep an eye out for part two coming soon when we get to the actual pattern that is going to be filling this enormous space. <sighs> I'm really excited.